Thank you, Ashwin. Good evening. How are you? <laughs> Welcome. Um, I thought Will was fantastic. Really great. Um, the thing is, he said everything I was going to say. <laughs> so, um, that being the case, a short talk on my summer holidays, I think, will now follow. <laughs> and, and the marvellous time I had. <laughs> right, actually, Will is somebody you have to listen to. I say that because uh, Will taught for years. I think over 20 years he was a high school teacher. And uh, in every other field, uh, if we were looking at urgent issues and how to confront them, we'd talk to the people who do the job, wouldn't we? And uh, for some reason, education is one of those fields where uh, particularly national politicians sometimes seem to think that the last people who know anything about the job are the people who do it. And uh, this isn't uh, a peculiar fact in America. Uh, I find this is true around the world. Now, I ought to say something right now. Uh, firstly, I am not from America. <laughs> I think it's important to point this out, lest there should be any confusion. Uh, but I do live here now. Uh, we moved here, my wife and I and our two kids, we moved to America 12 years ago. Uh, in fact, many British people are moving back to America. <laughs> it's all part of a long-term plan. <laughs> actually, uh, we got here, my wife and I, our two kids, James and Kate, my son James is actually here with me today. Uh, we arrived here in America on uh, the 30th of June, 2001. Uh, which is four days before Independence Day. We had no idea. I mean, get over it, really. I mean... <laughs> what a way to behave, honestly. People marching up and down, beating drums, blowing trumpets, celebrating the fact the British have left. Do you know how that makes us feel <laughs> when we've just arrived? We've, we've had to endure 12 of these now. Actually, we've got the hang of it. We spend Independence Day indoors. We do. We close the shutters and light the fire and look at old photographs of the Queen. And <laughs> wait for the whole dismal business to pass over for another year. But we live here. This is my point. Uh, we have green cards and uh, we are applying for citizenship. So there. <laughs> I say this not to ingratiate myself with you, though that's always a good strategy, I feel, uh, but because uh, I just want to assure you that I haven't just popped over here, uh, you know, from London, to have a quick shout at the American education system and, and get back on the plane tomorrow. You know, we live here. And I've been around it and in it and uh, thinking about it for the past 12 years, and I've traveled all over America. It's been a great privilege of mine to do it. I think this is, I don't know how many times I've been in Atlanta, but a lot. Um, I was actually in Savannah, Georgia recently. Is anybody here from Savannah? You, you needn't clap yourself for that. I mean, it's really, I mean, you can if you want. But <laughs> no, but Savannah, uh, the, the streets of Savannah are covered in cobblestones. And the cobblestones uh, in Savannah, you know this, don't you, those of you who've been to Savannah, the, the, the harbour area is covered in cob cobblestones. And, um, and they reminded me of the cobblestones in the streets in Liverpool, where I grew up uh, in England in the 1950s. There are cobblestones up and down all the streets, uh, by the docks especially. And I was telling this to the lady who was showing me around Savannah. I said, these are just like the cobblestones I used to see in Liverpool. She said, well, that's not a coincidence. They are from Liverpool. And uh, the reason is that when all the uh, ships bringing cotton from the south went to Liverpool in the 19th century, uh, they were full, but they went back empty. And uh, because you know, we weren't exporting anything back to Georgia, uh, we were importing from you. So they used to fill up the ships with cobblestones as ballast so they could make the journey back. 
through the high seas. And then when they got to Georgia, when they got to the port of Savannah, they emptied all these cobblestones out into the ground, you know, actually into the harbor, uh, until eventually they blocked the harbor. Then they paid somebody to take them all out of the harbor and put them on the land. And then they paid the same person to line the streets with them. So Liverpool has transplanted part of itself to Georgia. And I am from the port of Liverpool. So here I am. I'm your latest import. But the reason I tell you this is that Liverpool in the 19th century was the most important port in the world. That's not jingoism, that's just true. It was the most important port in the world. 60% of world trade passed through the port of Liverpool in the 19th century. Um, and it was all sorts of trade, as you know. But Liverpool was a bustling, booming city. It was the most important port in the British Empire. And I haven't come here to tell you about the empire, just to tell you one thing. Uh, well, actually two. One is that if you had gone to the court of Queen Victoria in 1860 or 1870, you would have found her ruling over the largest empire in the history of humanity. That's not an opinion, that's just a fact. You know, Britain had the largest empire, the largest economy, the largest manufacturing base, and the greatest program of colonialism. Uh, it was the empire in which the sun would never set, meaning it was so far flung that whenever the sun went down somewhere, it came up somewhere else on the empire. And um, we had the biggest military and the biggest navy. If you had said to Queen Victoria in the middle of that visit, by the way, Your Majesty, this empire on which the sun will never set will be finished within a generation. You would have been laughed out of the building. Nothing would have seemed more preposterous than the idea that the empire would be over, not in a thousand years, but in a generation. But it was. By the end of the First World War, the British economy and social structure was fatally wounded. It took a while for it to play out, but by the end of the Second World War, it was finished. Absolutely finished. And I was born in 1950 into a post-imperial country. Liverpool was a bomb site. It was bombed by the Luftwaffe, uh, as, as much as London was. Uh, the Docklands were derelict, and it was over. I grew up in uh, a city full of bomb craters and uh, gas masks. And we were all on rationing, as I recall. Um, and we had utility blankets that were part of the aid program the government put together. It happened in a generation. My grandparents remembered the empire. I don't. I don't at all. Liverpool was devastated. The Beatles and all of that has been part of the regeneration of Liverpool. You go to Liverpool now, by the way, it's a fantastically interesting and thriving city. It's recreated itself. It's reborn itself, rebirthed itself. But I say it for these two reasons. Firstly, that the history of empires is that they crash. There's a very good book on empire, actually, by a guy called Jared Diamond. I don't know if you've come across him. Uh, he wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, and he wrote a book about empires and what happens to them. He called the book Collapse. I think, actually, Jared was ill-advised uh, because once you've read the title of the book, you know, <laughs> you don't really need the book. You know, it's a... <laughs> What happens to empires, Jared? Uh, they collapse, as a matter of fact. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> I will buy a different book. <laughs> On another subject with a more oblique title. So, Jared, but you look at what happened to the Soviet Empire, you look at what happened to the Ottoman Empire, you look at what happened to the Russian Empire, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Roman Empire, you can go on. They tend to collapse. Uh, it happens because they overreach themselves economically or militarily or they become complacent or they become internally divided. You know, you know, you know as, well, as much about this as I do. But it's what happens to them. Uh, no previous empire is still a global empire except this one because America ruled the world as, as thoroughly in the 20th century as Britain and Europe ruled the, the world in the 19th. And of course the Spanish Empire before that. But it could stop. And I don't say it because I hope it will. On the contrary, we live here. We just moved here. <laughs> I'm coming here to plead with you. 
not to let this happen. But one of the things that happens is this. If the young generation becomes disengaged, disenfranchised, uninterested, uh, detached um, from its own communities, the problem already has started to take root. Education is the way in which we invest in our own future and the futures of our children. And the problem, as Will indicated, which I think is the theme of this strand of Leadership Atlanta, which, by the way, is a fantastic initiative. I do congratulate the organizers on this. But this, this particular strand, I think, is absolutely central because it's education that we depend upon to cultivate the sensibilities, the talents, the abilities, the outlook, the aptitudes on which we all depend, uh, both our children, ourselves. It's the way in which we pass on uh, the, our traditions and our histories. It's the way we engage in the present, and it's how we prepare for the future. And at the moment, we have an education system. I say we, because it's not just in America. It's, it's a global issue, as Etienne pointed out, that is seriously um, divorced from the way the world is actually functioning and the lives our children are actually leading. And there are efforts happening all around the world to reform education, to improve the current model. My view, and I think you'll hear it from a lot of the speakers here uh, during the conversations uh, tomorrow and in the labs, is that the current system doesn't need to be tweaked or improved. It needs to be replaced. It needs to be transformed into something else. That's why we call this transforming education, not making it a little bit better. <laughs> so I want to put three ideas to you on this basis. One of them is that we are living, and Will intimated this, in times of revolution. And I think that's literally true. There are, uh, as he said, uh, dynamics and forces at play in the world now which have no precedent in human history. The second theme is that if we're to meet this revolution, we have to think differently about our students, ourselves, and our children. And the third theme is that we have to therefore do things differently. We can't think differently then act in the same way. We have to do things in a different way. I suppose if you just wanted to headline it, you wanted to compress it, if you're anxious to tweet. Uh, um, the problem is that our current systems of education were conceived, organized, and implemented at the height of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. And they are modeled on the principles and procedures of industrial production. They are based on conformity, compliance, and linearity. The problem is that human life is diverse, creative, and organic. And apart from that, it's a perfect fit. <laughs> let, let me ask you a question. I'm going to, whether you allow me to or not, frankly. But, but let me ask you a question. How many of you have got children of your own? OK. Uh, or grandchildren? OK. And the rest of you have seen such children. Small. <laughs> small, small people wondering about. I'll make you a bet, and I'm confident I will win this bet. If you've got two or more children, I bet you they are completely different from each other, aren't they? Aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. <laughs> you know, my... <laughs> Your mother and I are constantly getting you mixed up. We're going to introduce a, a system of color-coded T-shirts, just so that we can get you straight in our minds. Even identical twins are completely different. I don't mean they're not alike. Of course they are. But you would never confuse them. And they would, the people who are close to them don't confuse them either. The reason is we're all different. We're all unique. Human life is predicated on diversity. Human life is inherently creative. Human life is not linear. For historical reasons, our education systems were created on the opposite principles in the interests of industrialism. And one of the reasons is economic. They were developed that way to provide a workforce for the Industrial Revolution. I grew up in Liverpool, as I say, in, it was still industrialized when I was growing up, but it, it's not so much now. But the great majority of people in the British uh, workforce did manual work, and they were educated to do that. And a, a minority of people did professional work, and they were educated to do that. It's why a small group of people went to university, and most people didn't. Uh, 
the current economic circumstances are wholly different, but our current systems are still trudging forward on the same base. I don't mean they're not changing, but they're not really changing radically enough or quickly enough. When I say there's a revolution, um, let me spell this out. Uh, politicians of all stripes, you know, and this happens globally, it's not just, a, I think, an American phenomenon, love the expression, getting back to basics. You know, say, Let's get back to basics. And, uh, and there's an assumption that we all know what these basics are. And there's something to do with math and science and the STEM disciplines. And they're related, in some way, to the golden age of education, which is alleged to have happened in the 1950s and 1960s, when these politicians were themselves at school. <laughs> and so they look back fondly to this time of extraordinary achievement by themselves and their peer group. I was at school in that period too. It was not a golden age, by the way. <laughs> it was not. It was not. All the problems I'm talking about have their origins then and before. They're in the DNA of the current system. But the basics, at any rate, are not a group of subjects. I think for the transformation of education that we need to talk about, the whole idea of subjects isn't helpful anyway. But the idea there should be a small group of subjects, however they're defined, that sit at the heart of education, I, I think is misconceived. Do you remember Margaret Thatcher? Uh, well, when Margaret Thatcher was queen uh, in England, <laughs> she was... <laughs> she <laughs> no, when she... Uh, you may not know this, but before she became prime minister, one of the jobs she occupied in the government was education secretary. And so when she became uh, prime minister, she had a big interest in education, and she presided over what became a, a fundamental reform of the education system. And one of the features of the, of the new system was they set out a core curriculum. Does this sound familiar in any way? And in the core curriculum, there was a lot of conversation and debate in the country. Like, what would, it, what would be in it? What would be out? What would be included? What would be excluded? Um, uh, so we waited breathlessly, you know, because there are lots of different ways of thinking about the curriculum. You know, areas of knowledge, domains, fields, all sorts of ways of thinking about this. Anyway, the education secretary at the time announced to a breathless world in 1988 in Britain that the core curriculum would be based on 10 subjects. So the implication is there were 10 subjects in the world that mattered. Now this is handy because there are five days in the week. <laughs> so there's time for lunch, you know, if you organize this properly. <laughs> the trouble is there are not 10 subjects in the world. There are multiple ways of carving up human knowledge and experience, far more than 10 of them anyway. The trouble is, if you live in a 10-subject world and tell people that's what, how many there are, you run into problems when they, you come across an 11th possible subject, which happened in the case, for example, of dance and theatre. So we were told that dance was really a form of physical education and theatre was really a form of English. Well, they're not. If I had more time, I could go into this, but they're not. <laughs> there is a big difference between ballet and track and field. <laughs> like winning, you know, would be one, you know. Like... <laughs> you don't come out of a performance of Capelia saying, who won? <laughs> I think it was the girl in pink, but I can't be sure. It was a bit of a... <laughs> <laughs> Bit of, a, bit of a scrum right at the end there, but... <laughs> anyway, the government helpfully identified that there were already two types of subject. There were there, what they called core subjects and what they called foundation subjects. The core subjects were more important. Uh, you might guess what they were. The core subjects were English, math, and science. And the foundation subjects were the humanities and art and music. It, it amazed me how quickly people picked up on this language and ran with it. So people started talking almost immediately about the core and the foundation subjects, like these were real, rather than an idea the government had come up with in the back of a taxi cab. <laughs> you know, it was like the Secretary of State had come down from the mountain, you know, with two stone tablets, and <laughs> on one there were inscribed the names of three subjects, and the other one had seven. <laughs> <laughs> and it was decreed there would be core subjects and foundation subjects, and the, and the core subjects would preside over the foundation subjects. And, <laughs> and it will be good. <laughs> <laughs> well,
Well, it was not good. It was dreadful, as a matter of fact. And uh, so but we had to spend a lot of time arguing against it. Well, this is what's happening in America now with the concept of STEM disciplines. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, which is based on a peculiar conception of utility. This is not an argument against science, technology, engineering, and math. They're vitally important. Do not mistake me. They are vitally important. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. But the whole implication of this emphasis is that the other disciplines don't really matter. They're not in the core standards, so they really don't matter. And so far as the political argument seems to be, the future depends exclusively on people becoming good at math, science, and technology. Well, what about the kids who don't like those things or aren't particularly good at them and it's not their calling? You see, this country has depended for its growth on multifarious expertise and dis in disciplines right across the board, on writers, on poets, musicians, dancers, entrepreneurs, business leaders, humanitarians, philanthropists. Some of these people may be interested in science and technology, others not. Uh, some of the people interested in science and technology are in equally passionate about math and music and art and theater. It's a false conception based on the old model of thinking of supply and demand and utility. But the idea is really that if you happen to be interested in things other than the STEM disciplines, you can sit this one out. You know, we don't really need you yet. We're going to leave this to the technologists and the scientists to figure the future out. And you can sit on the bench and as soon as they've got it sorted, we'll call you. Well, it's all adding to the disaffection that we see in our school system. The basics are not subjects, they are purposes. And there are at least four, I would put this to you, there are four purposes to education that I would offer as, as at least one way of framing the conversation of the next couple of days. Uh, they're not in order, but one of them is economic. We all know that, don't we? That one of the purposes for education is to enable our children to become Economic, I'm talking about up to high school, but actually it goes beyond there, but let's talk about high school for the minute. But one of the purposes is to enable our kids to become economically productive and independent. We want that nationally, and we want it personally, don't we? I mean, I'm a parent. You know, don't we want that? We all want our kids to become economically independent, don't we? <laughs> I do. I can't tell you, you know, how much... <laughs> I want my children to become economically independent, you know, and, and as soon as possible. <laughs> but what does that mean in the current context? You see, the old model of industrialism required very few people to go into higher education. But the new model actually requires things other than those things that were bestowed on people through traditional higher education. There was a report published a few years ago by uh, IBM called Capitalizing on Complexity. They interviewed 1,800 CEOs from around the world and asked them what kept them awake at night. They said there were two things really that concerned them most, that there were priorities in running companies, corporations of various sorts. The first one, they said, was uh, how to run organizations which can adapt quickly to change, which are responsive and flexible in a world that's changing more quickly than ever. And by the way, if you want evidence, and there's a lot of it, but if you want a current example, of what happens when people don't adapt, you don't need to look much further than Kodak. Kodak, one of the biggest corporations in America, one of the most successful, long-lived organizations, is now in receivership. And the reason is not that people have stopped taking photographs. Actually, Kodak invented home photography. The, the, uh, the Brownie camera, which they introduced in the early 1900s, was the iPad of its day. It changed the world. It's hard to recapture the excitement that that device brought into American culture. It's like the Model T Ford. It's, it's like the iPad now. It's like the iPhone 5. People were thrilled to have this thing. It opened up a whole new vista for them. Now it's a museum piece, and Kodak, which also invented digital photography effectively, is going out of business, at least as we know it, and with it, the town of Rochester. But it's not because people have stopped taking photographs. As Will said, people are taking more photographs than ever irritatingly more photographs <laughs> than ever on Facebook. You know, that's what happened. Instagram came along and Facebook bought them and off they go. You know, so people are now taking photographs by the moment, you know, of their cappuccino. <laughs> here is my cappuccino and here it is when I just drank a bit of it. <laughs> Great. I'm so grateful we have photography to record these, <laughs> these important moments. 
So how do you, how do you move quickly and adapt to change? That's the first thing. Uh, actually, I came across this. I thought you'd like this. This is about um, uh, how complicated the world's becoming. Um, but uh, I, I came across this recently. It's about what it means to be British these days. I came across this in it, but honestly, you could substitute American or any other nationality you want, honestly. But uh, I thought you'd like it. It says that being British these days means driving home in a German car, stopping to collect some Danish lager or Irish Guinness, then sitting on a Swedish sofa, eating an Italian pizza or an Indian curry, watching American programs on a Japanese TV. <laughs> and the most British thing of all, suspicion of anything foreign. I'd say that's broadly right. Uh, I got a, I have a, a picture to show you here. What do you think? I published this book, or a version of this book, 10 years ago. Uh, it's called Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. Uh, this book, by the way, is terrific. <laughs> Honestly, you, you'd be mad not to buy this book. <laughs> But about uh, two years ago, the publisher contacted me and said, we'd like to do a new edition of the book. Uh, ten years on, I know it's a masterpiece, as we know, so, <laughs> so we're going to do some new artwork, and would you like to make any changes to the text? Well, it seemed to me improbable, you know, that it could be improved in any way. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was after all, a masterwork, you know, so, which I had composed myself. But I said I'd take a look at it, and, you know, Honestly, what I had in mind was a weekend with a spell check. I mean, I, <laughs> I did, I, and a bottle of Jack Daniels. And I thought, you know, <laughs> under duress, I might relocate the occasional semicolon as a sign of good faith. <laughs> I rewrote the entire book from start to finish, from start to finish. There are whole new chapters in the book. Every example has been updated. New ones have been included. I've updated all the figures and information. There's not a sentence untouched in the book. It's a new book apart from the title. So if you bought the original edition of Out of Our Minds, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's dreadful. Uh, you, uh, you must immediately buy this new version. But one of the reasons is that so much has happened in 10 years. I mean, just take technology as one strand. I mean, 10 years ago, there were no, I no iPads. There were no iPhones, there were no smartphones. Uh, there was no Tumblr, no Flickr, no Instagram. Uh, email was still kind of struggling to its feet for a lot of people. People weren't texting uh, anything like now. Um, there was no Twitter. I mean, Etienne has pleaded with you to tweet. I mean, 10 years ago, people didn't tweet, did they? I mean, if they did, they were discouraged, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> people would say, I'm sorry, what was that? What, what was that? <laughs> would you mind not doing that? This is we're in a public place. <laughs> anyway, by the way, I rewrote the book on Microsoft Word. Do you ever use Microsoft Word? <laughs> I was in Microsoft headquarters recently. I, I told them this. I thought they needed to know. Well, Microsoft Word's great, but it has opinions. <laughs> Doesn't it? It has opinions. When you're writing, apart from auto-correcting things in anticipation of what you might want to say, when you said something, if it doesn't like it, it gives you a little squiggle underneath. <laughs> well, sometimes it's all right, you know, because it's correct, you know, it's drawing your attention to a misplaced comma. Well, that's all right. Um, uh, and in America, there's this irritating habit it has of, of taking the use out of words, you know, that <laughs> quite clearly should be in there. So, <laughs> but they're right. But the ones I don't like are the green squiggles you get when it just disapproves of what you've written. <laughs> like, you know, like a style thing. There's a style police thing going on at Microsoft Word. Like the passive voice. So you can't say, you know, this conference was convened by our leadership Atlanta. That's the passive voice, was convened. You have to make it all active and say, leadership Atlanta convened the conference and make it all active. What would have happened to the great works of literature if they'd all been written in Microsoft Word? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Like Walt Whitman, you know, and Virginia Woolf and John Milton. You know, it'd all be in this jaunty vernacular, wouldn't it? You know, 
making all these points in 140 characters or less in the active voice. <laughs> it doesn't always work out. I wrote this, this sentence uh, in the book. I was writing about intelligence testing. I said, the foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. That's quite true, by the way. Uh, that's a good sentence, isn't it? You wish you'd written that sentence, don't you? <laughs> now, I could feel the little jolt of envy that went round the room. You know, I, why can't I write stuff like that? <laughs> I'll read it again. It's... <laughs> so you can soak in the nuances here. <laughs> the foundations of the modern intelligence test were laid in the late 19th century by Sir Francis Galton, a cousin of Charles Darwin. Microsoft Word didn't like that. It has the passive verb in it, were laid. So it suggested this alternative in the active. This is quite true, by the way. You can type the sentence to find out, it will do it. This is their alternative in the active voice. In the late 19th century, Sir Francis Galton laid a cousin of Charles Darwin. <laughs> you don't have to draw that, by the way. It's entirely... <laughs> up to you. <laughs> you can leave a little blank there, and we'll fill it in later on. <laughs> the foundation of the modern intelligence test, that's how that sentence ends. So one of the reasons that I say it's a revolution is the rate of change of technology. But listen, here's the thing. All this stuff we think is so fancy is the beginning of a much more profound revolution in our relationship with technology. Here's one idea that's starting to get people's attention. This is a version of Google Glass. It's a wearable computer. It's not things you strap on you know, to your knee, but things you strap all over you. Uh, wearable computing. This is the next horizon, but it's not the final horizon. The real horizon, these stuff, I mean, I personally don't like this idea a bit, but, uh, but if you read uh, the work of people involved in the singularity movement, they are arguing strenuously and, and accurately, I think, that the next wave of technology beyond this will be the integration of information systems with the human mind. Not things you wear on you, but things you wear within you. Um, this is one image that kind of captures it. That, um, <laughs> but computers that will be implanted, the merging of humanity with technology. And this isn't fanciful, this is based on existing technologies and is heading our way. 20 years from now, a lot of these devices that we think are so smart and groovy, like the iPhone 5, uh, will be relegated to the same slot in history as the Kodak Brownie camera. Your great-grandchildren, if you're young now, will be looking at photographs of you, if you're at school now, with your iPad, you know, with a pitying smile on their face. <laughs> what, the, what, like it was a thing? You had to carry it around, it was like an object, was it? And you have to touch it. You know, how was that? You know, <laughs> it hasn't stopped. The other thing that's changing the world is population growth. For most of human history, there were very few people around. That's the population in the developed countries. So you see, for most of human history, there are very few people around. We're heading for about, you know, just over a billion uh, by, the middle, by the end of this century. That's the developed world coming in. There are now about 7.5 billion people on the planet. We're heading for 9 billion by the middle of the century, maybe 10 billion by the end of it. That's more people than have ever lived on the planet at the same time in the history of humanity. If you combine all of that with um, the technological revolution that's about to hit us, it's no exaggeration to say that these are unprecedented times. That, by the way, is an image of a favela in Caracas in Venezuela. Uh, about 60% of the world's population will be living in cities. It's why the creative cities strand in this conference is so important. Because if we don't get it right in cities, we're not going to get it right. For most of history, very few people lived in cities, and now the majority do. Do you know, um, I mean, I'd say they're not going to be groovy cities like Atlanta. You know, they're going to be great vernacular cities like this. Greater Tokyo, which is a groovy city, has a population of 34 million people, which is more than the entire population of Canada in one urban sprawl. The thing is, we don't know if we can handle all this. There was um, a program on the BBC a while ago about how many people can live on Earth. It was called, How Many People <laughs> Can Live on Earth? And the BBC has a gift for titles. 
they came to this conclusion, if everybody on Earth, and the more of, an, more of us now than ever before, if everybody on Earth consumed food, fuel, water, and so on, at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. Uh, but of course, we don't all consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda. They said if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, that's us, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion. And we're four times past that now. So in other words, if the whole world wants to live as we've been living for the past 150 years, and they do, there's no indication, is there, in the emerging economies where the population is growing so rapidly, uh, that they are happy now to take the foot off the pedal and say, look, we can see you guys had a great time there in America. Uh, you know, but we know the party's over, but send us the photographs. You know, they want what we've had and what we do have. But if they do want that, then by the middle of the century, on current trends, we'd need four more planets to make this feasible. Well, we don't have them. So the need to think differently and think creatively has never been greater. Education is in the front line. When I say the basics, there are four. Economic. The second is cultural. You know, the great challenges we face on Earth now are how to live together, how to cope with this complexity, how to understand each other's points of view, other people's worldviews, other people's frames of reference. Many of the great conflicts in the world now are cultural as much as they are economic in character. The third is social. You know, how do we engage people now in our communities? I was saying earlier, you know, there was an election recently for the new mayor of Los Angeles. It was a multi-million dollar campaign spread over two or three years. 15% of the electorate showed up to vote. When people withdraw from the democratic process, democracy stops working. But you don't get people to engage in democracy by giving them talks about it, by getting, but by getting them to live it. Our schools have to reflect the social processes that we want to celebrate and perpetuate. But the real purpose of education, on which all the others depend, and the one I want to get to, is personal. And this is the big shift I think we have to make. That education is failing many of our children precisely because it's impersonal. You see, the factory model of education treats kids as commodities, it treats them as data points, and when we drive the system by test results only and lose sight of the feelings and humanity in the system, then we lose sight with the system itself. The reason I ask you about your children, thank you very much, but the reason I ask you about your two children, uh, if you have two or more, and about their being different, is that education in the end is a personal process. Now let me bring it home here. In Georgia, I was reading the recent economic report about education, the economic implications of education in Georgia. You know this better than I do. Across the country, the average rate of withdrawal from high schools is about 30%. On average, that's a 30% of kids who start the senior year, at high, the, so it start the ninth grade in high school, don't complete high school. In many parts of the country, it's higher. It's actually higher in parts of Georgia. As you know, I think the average figure here is about 51% of kids who don't complete high school. I resist the term dropout because dropout is it's too big a term for the multiplicity of reasons people have for not completing their high school education. Some people find their family circumstances get in the way. Uh, some people find it doesn't engage their interest. Others are pulled out for all sorts of reasons. To call them all dropouts makes it sound as if they have failed, when it may be the system has failed them. You know, if you were running a business and you lost 50% of your customers a year, I think you might at some point say, well, is it us? You know, <laughs> are we doing something? Every child who stays in education has a reason to be in. Everyone who pulls out has a reason to pull out. And, until, and unless we understand that education is personal, that every child in the system is a person with a biography, with motivations and feelings, then it won't work. The big shift I think we have to make in the transformation of education is to radically personalize it to every child in the system. And that means taking full account of the different ways in which children learn, it means taking full account of the different things that engage and draw their interest. That has implications for the curriculum. It means being able to schedule education around the individual learning styles and interests of every child. It's perfectly possible, by the way. If you were running a business the way we run our schools, you would be out of business in a week. If every 45 minutes, every member of your workforce had to stop what they were doing, 
pack their bags up, go to another room in some other part of your facility, and do something else for 45 minutes with a different group of people, you'd be bankrupt in a week. But we're in our education systems constantly on this basis. And then we wonder why people are dropping out, or pulling out, or not succeeding, or being engaged. Education, you know, when it comes to it, is a, it's a human process, and it's an art form. Teaching is an art form. And what's happened, I think, in this mad clamor to try and meet the demands of standardized testing is that we've lost sight of the artistry and humanity at the heart of education. All the things I remember about my education, like I'm sure you do about yours, are to do with the people, the teachers, and the experiences they provided for me. So personalizing education, I think, has to be at the very heart of the conversation here for the next couple of days, what it means and how it works and the successes that naturally accrue around it. But there's a second strand, which is making education local. You know, it was estimated in the same economic report that if you could halve the withdrawal rate from high schools, there would be a massive economic bounty in the state of Georgia. Multi-millions of dollars would accrue to Georgia from increased earnings from people who completed their education, from savings on social programs, from increased taxation, from the positive impact on housing prices, and so on and so forth. There is a huge economic dividend from re-engaging people properly in education, and a huge economic penalty for not understanding the genuine consequences of it. But it also involves the complementary strategy of making education local. I was sent a very interesting account here of the uh, development of the Fulton County Charter School District. Charters are a different conversation, we could have them, but th the proposal here for Fulton County, as I understand it, is based on the localization of educational responsibility to individual schools through school governing councils. I think that's the right way to be moving here. Schools, in the end, are all local to their communities. All the problems emerge when we try to detach them from their communities. You see, culture is the key word, and this is just what I want to get us to. The real shift is in changing metaphors. The industrial metaphor has dominated education since the middle of the 19th century. The industrial metaphor has given us the current system. I believe we need to shift to a different type of metaphor, to an organic metaphor. Culture is an organic term. Schools are not like mechanisms, they're like organisms. They're living, breathing communities of people who have reciprocal hopes, dreams, and possibilities. I have yet to find a kid who can't really be educated. I've yet to find a school that can't be improved if the capacity for innovation is given to the schools, the principals, and the teachers who do the work. There's a lovely example, I just want to leave it with you, of a place in California called Death Valley, on the border of Nevada. Death Valley is the hottest place in America, and nothing grows there because it doesn't rain. In the winter of 2004, it rained in Death Valley. Seven inches of rain fell in Death Valley. And in the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers. People came from all across America to see this extraordinary sight that they thought wasn't possible, that Death Valley was alive. Well, what it showed is that Death Valley isn't dead, it's dormant waiting for the right conditions to come. And if the conditions are right, life is inevitable. That's the way it is with organic systems. And I think it's exactly the same way with schools and school districts. If you create the conditions for growth, growth is inevitable. If you create barren conditions, things shrivel and pull away and protect themselves. The real challenge, I think, for the transformation in Georgia of your education systems is not to perpetuate the model of command and control, but to delegate responsibilities creatively to the schools who do the work, to believe in the abilities and powers and hopes and aspirations of the students and of the teachers who work with them, to invest in that process and to see that your role isn't command and control, it's climate control. To create a new climate of possibility in which you, I think, will reap a new harvest of creativity, innovation and engagement across the whole state. By the way, even if you get it right, and I think you will and I hope you will, uh, you still won't be able to predict the future because life isn't like that. But I do think, working collaboratively through Leadership Atlanta, that you will collectively create a future that you'd all want to live in. Thank you very much.